Good afternoon. Welcome back. Welcome back, dear friends. I hope you we energize yourself. And let, let's start this afternoon session. And of course, we Dada and I are listeners this afternoon session, at least in the beginning, but um we are going to start with the action groups this afternoon. And just uh, a little bit of the history of the action groups. Can we, can we close the door? Can somebody close yes. it? Okay, I got it. When we started with the, or founded the Alliance in 2014, it was of course, and we see today again, how excellent it is to have an inclusive uh, Alliance networking organization. Inclusive means all stakeholders on board and around the table. But of course, it's also about what we thought, not only discussing, but also about action. So we, proposed and it was adopted to have three action groups. One action group on knowledge, one action group on investments and finance, and one action group on enabling environment. And that's why these three crazy guys were sitting and now in front of you, but excellent guys, Alison, Ernie and Maria Rosa have done excellent work over the last couple of years related to the action groups. So this afternoon, before we have a sunny reception, we have are in their hands. I give the floor to you. Well, thank you very much, um, Hans and Dada. We had a wonderful morning, and now we're into the second part of our program where the rubber hits the road. And we're gonna be bringing forward and sharing success stories that have come out of the action groups that Rosa, Allison, and I have had the honor and privilege of co-chairing for the last several years. And I think it's really appropriate that we spend the next 90 minutes hearing examples of GAXA members doing real work on the ground that are helping to expand climate smart agriculture across the globe. And we have today five I guess I were calling them case studies or a little mini reports that we're going to be sharing that will give you a just a taste of the type of work that's happening across our three action groups. And we have organized these three action groups, as Hans had said, to enable us to divide up and to focus on some of the most important building blocks of climate smart agriculture. And the first is what we heard a lot about this morning, and that's knowledge sharing. We have so many examples of systems and practices and programs and tools and investments that are available to farmers. But if the knowledge isn't shared, if producers aren't aware that these assets, these tools were available, then for, for what purpose are they? So when we structured GAXA back close to 10 years ago, we put a lot of priority around knowledge sharing to help enable the transfer of knowledge across the world so we can scale up quicker. In a similar way, we looked very hard at what needed to be done to further enable the scaling up of climate smart agriculture. And a lot of this work has to do with the technical and the policy needed to enable the practices that underpin the work we're doing to scale. So we created a separate group that really focused on enabling policies. And we have an example of that this afternoon. And the third action group, again, is was reflected in what we talked about this morning, is our investment action group. Because if we don't have resources to put behind these programs and these practices, their ability to scale are gonna be compromised. So this afternoon, we'll walk through these five case study examples of GAXA members doing real work on the ground. And remember, it's all about trying to drive and advance what we call the three pillars of climate smart agriculture. And that starts 
with what's most important to producers, which is being sustainable, being able to intensify the production of not just commodities, but also everything else that they produce, the water they filter the store, the carbon they sequester, the biodiversity that they enhance, the local economies they improve, the livelihoods that they benefit. That's what we mean when we mean sustainable intensification. It's not just about producing more of a commodity. The second pillar of climate smart agriculture that we work to address is adaptation and improvements and resiliency. And we all know from the examples that each of us have experienced in our home countries, the impact that changing climatic conditions are having on us. So these conditions are becoming increasingly erratic, increasingly extreme, and are compromising the ability of agriculture to be successful in delivering solutions to sustainable development goals. So pillar two is another essential area of focus for GAXA. And then the third pillar is sometimes what we spend a lot of time talking about in a separate silo is if it's not related to the first two, but that's greenhouse gas emission reductions. And the good news of climate smart agriculture is that these reductions or soil carbon sequestration, if we're thinking of that way to reduce or capture greenhouse gas emissions, is a co-benefit of sustainable, well-managed farms and ranches and woodlands across the world. So we don't have to wake up every day trying to help the farm community convince themselves to deliver greenhouse gas emission reductions. That we found is a concurrent benefit that comes when they're improving their own operations, their own livelihoods. So it just makes promoting what we're doing a little bit easier. So that's a quick overview of the three GAXA um, action groups. And now we're going to be getting to segue and shift into our five presentations. We have three that come under the knowledge action group, one from our investment action group, and a, another from our enabling action group. And the plan is that we're going to run through fairly brief and concise presentations. Each one is going to go no longer than eight minutes. We'll pause and allow a few questions after each, but we want to keep the program moving because at the end of the presentations, we put you to work. So this morning, we did a lot of sitting and listening. This afternoon, we're going to be rolling up our sleeves and dividing into three separate work groups. And we have a couple of questions that we're going to pose to you. And we are fortunate that we have some very capable recorders that will be introduced uh, in a little bit that will be helping to capture your comments. And for those in the room, we'll be dividing into three groups. For those online, you'll be dividing into three virtual rooms. So be pay attention. We're going to be uh, counting on your close attention to detail and giving us feedback as we go forward. We need to share the presentation. Say again? We need to share the presentation. Yes. So for our tech team, if you could share screen to allow presentations, we're about to move to our very first presentation. And that is going to be by uh, uh, Allison, Dr. Allison Morrow Chachachan who is an adjutant professor of international law in the Cornell Law School. She's also a senior research associate in the College of Agriculture of Life Sciences at Cornell University, where she's been leading a Cornell Climate Smart Farming and Climate Stewards programs. So Allison, we look forward to having you share your presentation with us. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Could you advance a few slides? That was the next slide. We'll make these all available to you. This is the overview that Ernie provided of our action groups. And next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you today about the Climate Smart Farming and Soil Health Initiatives at Cornell University. We're located in Ithaca, New York, and we are one of the strongest agriculture universities in, in our country. I'm presenting this with Debbie Aller, who's online, and Jenna Walzak and Emily Lindback, hopefully, who are also online, who work with Cornell University and Cooperative Extension. So next slide. 
So I think it's really important to start out with the farmer's perspective. And I, you can see on the screen here, this is a farmer whose name is Tor Oshner. He's located in Newfield, New York. We interviewed him a few years ago about climate change and agriculture, what he's seeing on his farm. And he says, a normal season <clears throat> does not seem like it happens anymore. It's either really dry or really wet. It seems like when we get rain, it's apocalyptic. We got five inches of rain in about an hour and a half, and I had a lot of soil loss. I see the impact for generations. So Tor is a field crops grower, organic grower, has about more than a thousand acres of land. So our really our program, next slide, is really meant to serve farmers. So we are working towards resilient and sustainable agriculture, ecological and social systems in the face of a rapidly changing climate. We launched the Climate Smart Farming Extension Team and program in 2015. It was the first uh, of its kind in, our, in the United States. Next slide. So here you can see our website. It is climatesmartfarming.org. And this website is useful for any farmers in the Northeastern United States. That's about 10 states along the Northeast, including uh, New York. And what we do here is provide a link to the applied research and research that happens at Cornell University. We've developed several decision tools, resources that we provide here and links to an extension team. Next slide. So I'm really proud of our extension team um, that I get to work with these wonderful individuals. You can see that all of them, except for Eric, are women, uh, strong women, uh, ag educators and specialists who work in the areas around New York State on ag resiliency and stewardship, dairy management, field crops, berries and grapes, soil health, vegetable production and viticulture. And what they do is they get questions from farmers in our region about climate change and they help provide solutions and also help them understand how to change practices to be climate smart. So next slide. We also, Cornell Cooperative Extension, this is a little bit hard to see, but establish the uh, a dedicated two educators dedicated full-time to work on climate change and resiliency. And they're located in the Hudson Valley, but really provide leadership for their, the entire state. They're doing a lot of farm visits, developing fact sheets, doing talks about mitigation and adaptation. So next slide. I wanted to share our decision tools. If you wanna go to the website, you can try them out. You would just put any address that's in New York State a farmer can go to this site and enter some field data, their location, um, the planting date, for example, I'm, this is, would be for the, uh, the next slide, is for the growing degree day calculator, and it would share with them where they are in the season as compared to the last several seasons and what the seasonal outlook looks like. So this is a really helpful tool that's updated on a daily basis. And it can also look back and see how the climate has changed over time. So next slide. The final thing on this portion is that Deborah and I have been co-leading a climate impacts assessment for New York State on agriculture. And this is like the IPCC or the National Climate Assessment for the US. This is a New York State assessment I think it's an extremely valu valuable exercise to do a climate impacts assessment and our assessment is focusing on adaptation as well. So next slide. Now I'm gonna present the work that Deborah Aller is doing at Cornell University and she's part of our New York Soil Health Resiliency Program where really they're focusing on advancing soil health management for sustainable agriculture. They're doing field research on cover cropping, tillage and carbon management, as well as new techniques for assessing soil health. And they're coordinating outreach activities and training events. So next slide. In case you're not aware, soil health is so critical to climate change, mitigation and adaptation. 
Healthy soils are comprised of biological, chemical, and physical properties. And I learned this because I took a three-day intensive soil health training at Cornell that was so fantastic. Uh, so our team is really looking at soil health and its connection to humans and, and the environment. Next slide. Okay. Um, the other thing that this team is doing is conducting comprehensive assessments of soil health and farmers can gather a sample or many samples from their farm, send it to the lab um, that was launched in 2006. We literally have processed 32,000 more than that samples over the and 20,000 of the last five years. And this gives farmers a sense of their soil health and assessment of that. It's incredibly helpful. And next slide, Debbie and her colleague, Joe Amsley, have also been conducting statewide and regional characterizations and publishing these reports. Next slide. And then really importantly, they've conducted many, many field days on farms last year around the state with 570 farmers participating. I had the honor of participating at the Central New York uh, field day. We had 75 farmers there and I talked about climate smart agriculture. It was on the Rodman lot farm. So that just gives you a snapshot. Um, next slide is our contact information of really the applied research, extension, outreach, um, and assessment work that we're doing at Cornell. Thank you. Okay, Allison, thank you. Is there a burning question? One, I, I don't want to get us bogged down here because we've got to get through five presentations, but if there's something that you really want to jump up and ask, we'll give someone a shot. Okay, hearing none, thank you very much, Allison. That was the first of our knowledge. That was the first of our knowledge sharing presentations. And now we're going to move on to another really exciting program that I personally have had a chance to be involved with and help support. And it's the African 4 our Nutrient Stewardship Program. And with us today, online virtually, is Dr. Shami uh, Zagor. Shami is the Director of Research and Development for the African Plant Nutrition Institute. He's based in Morocco and has spent his career working around his strong interest in application of crop soil models and decision support systems to improve recommendations for fertilizer and soil fertility management. So with no further ado, Shami, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this very important uh, discourse on uh, climate smart um, agricultural systems and um, looking at how we can um, contribute to global uh, network uh, for knowledge sharing and um, achieving impact uh, with the different uh, technologies. I'm um, going to address um, the highlights on a very novel projects that uh, we are implementing on uh, in Africa, addressing for our nutrient stewardship. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Clyde Graham, who's actually attending the meeting in person, and he is um, the uh, leader of um, the overall um, you know project and uh, a large part of what I'm going to talk about today has been um, supported uh, a lot by his uh, inputs. Um, so um, I just want to start by providing the context of um, the project. If I can go to the next slide, please. Um, Africa, it, it does stand out, uh, especially the sub-Saharan Africa um, sub-region. It does stand out as being the only region that he has a leg behind in um, achieving the levels of productivity growth that are needed to uh, achieve self food sufficiency. So, looking from uh, at the last uh, six decades, most other developing regions in the world have been able to accelerate crop production growth, um, reaching uh, about four times the hectare production levels. Africa has uh, experienced very slow growth and um, still um, experiences a very large uh, gap in uh, crop yields. And this low 
crop production situation is a, a key underlying factor of the high incidence of uh, hunger and malnutrition, but then also because um, uh, seventy percent of the population is directly or indirectly um, supported in terms of livelihood from agriculture is also a big uh, factor in lagging uh, overall economic development. And then in the agricultural systems context, because uh, the key factors underlying the low crop productivity uh, due to low uh, investments in organic and inorganic fertilizers, and that has resulted in extensive nutrient mining, mining and land degradation as well, which is a key factor that affects the overall um, sustainability of the region to climate change, and also uh, a large part of the driver of extensification, area expansion, uh, contributing most to uh, production growth and resulting in biodiversity loss and a large part of uh, emission of greenhouse gases associated with um, low input systems and um, and and area expansion into um, the areas that result in deforestation as well. Uh, if uh, you could click uh, next, please. Um, so um, our work as part of the 4R Nutrient Stewardship Program and other projects as well clearly demonstrate the potential for increasing productivity. So I'm just showing here a very typical um, on-farm research trial showing uh, on the left-hand side the farmer field, which represents about a one to two ton crop. And then at the top of the picture is a control plot without fertilizer, which actually performed better than the farmer plot just because of agronomy. And the next plots represent different input uh, levels um, and uh, reaching the last plot where we have balanced nutrition. And that's a, a tier case where we demonstrate that with uh, balanced nutrient management, we can actually readily uh, move from a one ton per hectare situation to a five to six ton um, per hectare situation, showing the potential that nutrients have in unlocking the potential of um, African um, agriculture. Next, please. So addressing the challenge of low crop productivity in Africa would depend to a large extent uh, on increasing nutrient application and in combination with other best agronomic practices as well. But uh, we do recognize the need to work towards efficient and effective nutrient use so that increased nutrient application translates into higher nutrient use efficiencies and then maximize the positive benefits that we derive from fertilizers and minimize the um, negative uh, environmental consequences whilst we build soil health and also the resilience of um, farming systems in Africa to climate change. Next, please. So to achieve this uh, goals, uh, the nutrient strategy provides a very novel framework that aims to ensure sustainability of nutrient um, use in global systems. So this is a, a global uh, framework based on global principles. At the core of sustainability nutrient management, and this is a framework developed by the global fertilizer industry and is now globally recognized um, by research community as well. So at the core of sustainable nutrient management is the need to apply the right source of nutrients. I just want to emphasize when we mention right source, we are not just talking about fertilizer, but also where relevant organic resources play a key part of uh, bringing in the right source of nutrients that have multiple benefits for soil health as well. And then ensuring that farmers apply nutrients at the right rate at the right time, at the right place. So achieving a good balance based on um, scientifically you know, proven uh, principles allows us to design a holistic nutrient management framework that uh, focuses on the four key management um, interventions on source, rate, time, and place. And this has to be done considering the overall farming systems because uh, uh, nutrient use in crop production is linked to other um, components of the farm livestock, um, investments in um, mechanization, 
and then also decision making in the economic um you know viability that farmers aim to achieve as well and uh, the uh, core part of uh, nutrient management based on resource rate time and place is very much relevant to the six core actions of responsible plant nutrition, which include um, digital solutions for improving decision support and, decision and, and information access, recycling of nutrients, producing not just um, high yields, but ensuring that the, we are paying attention to the nutritional value of the food produced, accelerated innovation, and uh, nutrient roadmaps. This is uh, ensuring that we better understand the sustainability of nutrient um, use at country levels. But more importantly, I think, and relevant for the meeting uh, today is uh, also ensuring that fertilizers are used uh, in a you know smart way to achieve um, environmental sustainability as well. And at a broader scale, the all aim of ensuring that we have a good balance in source rate and time is to achieve broader environmental, social, and economic sustainability um, as well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is a global framework that we have been adapting in the African context. And uh, for the last four years, we have been implementing the 4R Solutions uh, Project, which is funded by the Canadian government. And um, in the first phase of the project, we have actually been able to reach 80,000 smallholder farmers with a knowledge on how they can adapt 4Rs to um, improve the performance of uh, their farms. And we are dealing mostly with smallholder farming systems. So key components of the project include um, knowledge development and dissemination, then improving the overall agricultural productivity and farm income, but also to make sure that we are having an inclusive process that addresses some of the uh, gender disparities, the, uh, the disparities that we find on the continent, and then paying attention to environmental sustainability. And as part of our technical uh, process for developing solutions, we work on a diagnostic uh, process of identifying the key production constraints, including nutrient deficiencies, and then designing holistic 4R nutrient management recommendations for specific sites that address uh, farm specific needs. And then we uh, have a dissemination process that allows us to reach uh, farmers at scale uh, to derive impact. I just want to acknowledge the core partners of the project that are indicated in the slide. And we are also working with uh, national partners in the core countries of Ethiopia, Ghana, and uh, Senegal, where the project uh, has been uh, implemented in the first phase. Next, please. And then we are currently in the process of uh, exploring opportunity of a second phase, uh, which will expand uh, to uh, an additional three countries, Malawi, Ivory Coast, and Tanzania, and potentially looking at another five phase where we are aiming to then scale the uh, lessons learned from pilot sites in Ethiopia, Ghana, and Kenya to uh, an additional uh, three countries. Then I just wanted to end with the last slides just to highlight that a key emphasis of the program is translating knowledge into practice. And we do place a lot of emphasis in um, developing different technologies and tools that allow us to put knowledge into the hands of extension workers and farmers who really need to be using the four Rs. So we have developed a series of extension resources that are available on the project uh, website. And these are practically oriented uh, tools uh, that are adapted to smallholder farming systems. And we have also designed a digital learning program on building the capacity of extension systems for understanding and communicating the information on uh, four Rs. And with this uh, research and extension program, we have been able to achieve doubling of crop yields We've been able to also concurrently achieve uh, increase in fertilizer use efficiencies, which means less losses and higher economic benefit for the farmers, which um, adds a lot of credence to the potential and the value of four R's for sustainability and resilience of uh, African agriculture. Thank you very much.
Jamie, thank you very much for that great example of climate smart agriculture in action. And I personally, as I said, have had some involvement with this. And this is a wonderful example of multiple GAXA partners teaming up. So Fertilizer Canada, Clyde Graham, the, the Canadian government, we had our fertilizer partners, conservation partners, university partners working together to bring a program forward that is benefiting not just the climate, but farmers and the environment and stimulating economic development. So it's just a wonderful success story. And if you'd like to see a video on it, we felt so, we were so impressed by it. We wrote a case study and had a video produced in a report that we produced. So I'd be happy to share that as well. Okay, we're moving on to our third presentation today. And as your moderator, uh, yeah, yes? Uh, could, I'm, I'm afraid we're a little tight on time, but we'll come back and catch questions at the end. Can, you, can they go to the beginning of the slide there? So, yeah, there we go. So we're going to change the order, um, our track. Um, we're going to hold your presentation for one because GAXA members sometimes make mistakes. And I made a big mistake today in recruiting our next presenter, Terry Cosby, with the United States Department of Agriculture. I told him we wanted him to come and share about the investments that the US government was making in climate smart agriculture and told him that we were gonna have him on the program at 8.30 p.m. instead of 2.30 p.m. So I had my six hours off, he's six hours away. So Terry, I owe you big time for changing your schedule to be with us today. But Terry Cosby uh, is a friend, a colleague of many years, he is chief of the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, where he leads the premier federal conservation agency in the United States, which is known for the 3,000 local county field offices it has, where it helps farmers, ranchers, and private forest landowners implement voluntary conservation practices. Terry uh, began his career on his own family cotton farm, went on to study and earn his degree at Alcorn State University. And he is now the chief of the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service. Terry, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for accommodating my mistake and welcome to today's forum. Ernie, uh, Mr. Shea, good morning. And uh, great to be here with you. And, uh, and what I'll say, Mr. Shea, is only for you. <laughs> only for you so it's good to see you and uh and next time give me an invitation i want to travel with you uh and, and be on site so it, it's, it's good being with you this morning hope you can hear me okay and good morning to those of you here in the united states and good afternoon to all of you wherever you are in, in the world and it's great to be on with you this morning i have a few things i want to share with you uh and I'll try to stay on as long as I can uh, and maybe uh, see if there's questions. I know you're checking questions a little bit at the end here. But um, I want to talk a little bit about USDA and some of the work that we're doing at NRCS, or the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And one of the big things here we're doing is working with producers to combat climate change. And that's, that's something that is important to um, our country, our administration, and also to to USDA. I want to talk to you a little bit about my agency, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, we are an agency that works with private land owners. Um, over 70% of the land in the United States is privately owned. So over 70%, about 75, 76% of the land in the United States is privately owned. And these are the folks that we work with on a daily basis. To, to look at sustainability and, and all the things that, that go along with agriculture. Uh, right now, my agency, I have close to 11,000 employees that work at NRCS. Uh, you heard uh, Mr. Shea talk about the network that we have, almost 3,000 offices, almost one in every county in the United States. And so those landowners are able to walk into those offices or call us and visit with us. And I have staff there that's, that's that goes out and work with these producers. Now, a typical uh, day in the life of one of my field office staff is producer might call in, might stop in and say, hey, I have some conservation issues. I have some, some soil erosion issues. I have some water quality issues. I have, I have some resource issues on my farm. 
So one of those conservationists will accompany that producer to the land, write what we call a conservation plan. It's a record for the producer. It's a record of decisions and alternatives to solving those resource issues. And I want to, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the financial assistance that we offer those landowners to help with some of those resource issues or resource needs. And I'll talk a little bit about the technical assistance. Um, we offer a lot of technical assistance. Our agency was founded on technical assistance. Uh, we are, we're about 100 years old, uh, established back in, in the 1930s uh, by our founding father, Hugh Hammond Bennett. And our agency has, has been strong ever since. And the reason for our agency is, is that we had a local presence, which we call soil and water conservation districts. And then we also, and then we looked at how do we have that federal presence? And so my agency was formed out of the Dust Bowl back in the early 30s. And we've been providing that technical assistance all the time. And then we start having means for financial assistance. How do we get this work completed? How do we uh, incentivize farmers to do some of these things? Sometimes some of the things we recommend is a little risky. So how do, how do we compensate producers for doing this conservation? Now we don't pay for we don't pay for all the conservation that happens in, in, in this country. Producers, landowners, forest owners, these folks they do this because they know uh, stewardship is important if they're going to leave it for the next generations, and if we're going to feed a growing country, uh, they do this. So we do have some financial assistance, and a lot of that comes through what we call farm bills. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit later. Some of the key priorities for me, since like when I came in with the Biden administration, is improving equity, combating climate change, serving urban agriculture, workforce development, and building partnerships. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about our partnership building because it's very important that we have these very diverse and unique partnerships. A little bit on, on our work on climate change. It is focused on partnership with agriculture, with forestry, with our tribes, with businesses, and with communities. It takes a partnership to get this work completed. And first of all, you have to be able to explain to all of these different parts of society why this is so important. Why do we need to take care of our natural resources? And once you get buy-in from all those different communities, it works a lot better. My agency, we're voluntary. We're not, it, it, nothing is mandatory. Uh, we work on a voluntary basis. Landowners can call us and work with us. That's why we're so unique. Also, some of the things is we have incentives. Some of it is incentive based. We want farmers to try some of the things that we're recommending. Let's go out and do 50 acres on your 400 acre farm. And if it works, they'll probably do it on the whole 400 acres. So uh, we're incentive based. We're focused on creating new opportunities and markets for agriculture and forestry. Very important, new opportunities. And that's where a lot of this climate smart information comes in. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. A moment. We're focusing focused on ensuring rural America plays a key role in our transition to a cleaner source of energy. And that's something that's very important. So that involves farmers, ranchers, and, and a lot of this is land on the lead. My agency, USDA, supports a whole of government approach to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And we are really uh, honing in on that. And the work that we do at NRCS is gonna be a huge part of the, achieving that. And our president's climate plan also sets the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030. Agriculture here in the United States is gonna play a big role into that, especially when we start talking about climate mitigation and some of the work that we're doing across the landscape. Uh, agriculture, forestry, and rural America will play an important role in this. And one of the, one of the things that we try to do is talk about the role that agriculture and these privately owned acres play in, in reaching these goals. Now we have we get financial assistance from several ways. 
I talk about the Farm Bill. Uh, we, we are uh, implementing the 2018 Farm Bill right now. Uh, there's work going on on the next Farm Bill for 23. And a lot of the things that happen in the Farm Bill come down to my agency and we implement that. We're implementers. But we don't write legislation, we implement legislation. After Congress and the President pass this next Farm Bill, we'll see what's, what stays, what's new, and then we will implement whatever is there. But there's also some other legislation that happened this last year that gave NRCS a, a huge financial boost to help with this. Uh, we call it Inflation Reduction Act, we call it IRA. My agency received approximately $20 billion for my programs <clears throat> to help with this. Uh, we have several different programs under each one of these things. And well, I mean, I got someone calling me. I want to get that off here. We have several programs under, under this. Um, one of them is called our Environmental Incentive Program. We call it EQIP. We call we have a conservation security program. We call CSP. So these this twenty billion dollars came into my donor programs, and so we're able to into four of them. And we're able to offer more financial assistance to our landowners. $20 billion is a huge investment in conservation. And I have assured the secretary and also the Biden administration that my agency can deliver on this over the next four to five years. We can deliver on this $20 billion in our conservation program. It's the biggest investment that's been made in conservation in my career, and I've been at USDA for 43 years and uh, worked all over the country uh, here and also some international assignments, but I have never seen an investment in a single bill that gives us the opportunity we have with this Inflation Reduction Act of $20 billion. What it's going to do is the strategy is going to help us expand capacity. Uh, we're, the, the additional funding is going to be targeted. Where do we need it the most? Uh, we have a lot of things going on here in the United States from drought to fire to extreme weather condition. How do I target those funds to make sure we're reaping those climate benefits? The other thing is gives us the opportunity to streamline our program delivery. The things we did 40 years ago, we still can do today, but we got to do it in a different way. So we're streamlining a lot of these programs to make it uh, more inviting for producers to uh, walk in and say, I want to apply. The other thing is when we make these kind of investments, we got to look at what the outcomes are. We got to quantify these outcomes. So I have a team that's going to be working real hard to quantify. You know, one of the things that we have to do a better job of is when that family is sitting around the dinner table in the evenings, uh, having that dinner and they may be watching TV, how do we demonstrate that these investments that are being made in conservation are great. How do we tell that American public or even the world that investment in conservation is something that we all should be doing? What are the outcomes? What does it do for me? And so we're going to uh, be really talking about quantifications and outcomes, and that's a big part of the work that we're going to be doing. The other thing is we're going to be leveraging partnerships. We're going to be looking at all types of partners. Who who wants to come in? How do we leverage that? We can get so much done better if we have great partnerships. Another thing that I committed to when I came in is advance the equity. How do we make sure that we're covering vast areas, but we're also making sure that everyone is welcome in to, to join in in conservation? You know, one of the things I talk about is every acre counts, no matter where it is. And so we have to be diligent and make sure we look at every acre, whether it's in rural America are urban areas. And we have a lot of folks that really want to be involved in conservation and they might not have the four or 500 acres. They could be on a 10th of an acre. So how do we work with those folks also? Something else that came about this year is called Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities. And this was hugely, hugely successful. USDA invested $3.1 billion for 141 projects through this Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities. You know, when we first announced this, uh, we had allocated one billion dollars to this, but the it was it was just amazing the outpouring of proposals that came in. 
we had close to $20 billion of requests for the $1 billion that we put out there. And we were able to go back and add another couple of billion to that. And so we were able to uh, secure 3.1 billion and we funded 141 projects. These projects we provided are providing technical and financial assistance to producers to implement climate smart production practices on a voluntary basis on working lands, on working lands. You know, one of the things, the other thing that's going to help these projects is pilot innovation and cost effective methods for quantification, monitoring, reporting, and verification of greenhouse gas benefits. Develop markets and promote the resulting climate smart commodities. Just think about this. If you can say that you grew your corn, soybeans, cotton, whatever, in an environmentally friendly way, I think that, I think that is going to uh, sell. I think that that commodity is going to be more valuable than not doing it in a, in a climate friendly way. We've, we've received- Gary, holy... Gary, if I could yeah. cut in, uh, you've given us so much information, and this is a phenomenal example of another climate smart agriculture success story where government and NGOs and farmer organizations teamed up together, went to the Congress, got the funding approved, and then you were tasked with implementing it. So uh, unfortunately, we're at the point we need to move to the next presentation, but okay. this was very inspirational because you've got an audience of leaders across the world that hopefully could be inspired and go do something similar to team up and work with their member states to get the resources that are needed to operate locally. So Terry, if you can stay with us for Q&A at the end, that would be wonderful. If you cannot, your good friend Fred Yoder is here in the room, and I'm sure we could look to Fred and ask him to answer some questions about conservation in the United States. But Terry, thank you again, and apologies for getting the time mixed up. Okay, thank you, Dr. Okay, moving right along with our examples of innovative, successful Climate Smart Ag projects, we are going to turn to a third knowledge sharing program. And this is a program that involves knowledge sharing in Armenia around cover crops and soil health. And with us today to present and share some information is Artak Hatrachan, who's the program manager for soil health improvement projects in his country. He has 15 years of experience working with farmers in Armenia, where they are demonstrating the practices of soil health improvement and providing on-fine farm training for farmers. So Artak, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here. So um, agriculture plays a very critical role in our economy. Uh, about 30% of Armenian population is involved in agricultural sphere. And that's why, uh, and also agriculture is very vulnerable in our country for climate change. And uh, every year, uh, every year, almost uh, every year, we are having extreme um, heat events about uh, about 40 degrees Celsius uh, during the summertime, and farmers are very um, uh, suffering because of that, and they have lack of uh, water resources and some economical difficulties because of that. Having that in my mind, uh, I uh, cooperated with group of uh, farmers in Arad Valley. Yes, you need to tell him to go next. Next slide. Ah, next slide. Sorry, uh, I forgot. Uh, so um, uh, having that in my mind, uh, I I cooperated with group of farmers in Arad Valley, which is one of the main uh, agricultural production areas in Armenia, where farmers are using uh, soil intensively and growing different kinds of crops, vegetables and fruits. So this group of farmers had uh, jointly uh, land which was overused and uh, we agreed together to establish a practice of soil health improvement uh, demonstration plot. Uh, I applied to um, uh, Hubert Humphrey alumni uh, impact over the uh, program and got a grant to implement uh, the practice that I learned during my study at Cornell University in 2019 and 2020. 
So we established a, a, a plot, uh, 0 0.5 hectares of uh, soil health improvement uh, practice, where we applied a multi-mixture of cover crop. Uh, uh, we put electric fans over that um, plot you see on these pictures on the right side. And uh, we put fans over the plant, over the plot, and farmers divided this plot on seven batches, and there they, were, they were using this plot for rotational grazing of their animals. So uh, th this project started in 2021. At that year, Armenia had a very severe drought. And can you imagine uh, the other neighbors, uh, or the village neighbors in this community did not have uh, enough fodder for feeding their animals. These four farmers, were having every day fresh green grass for their uh, animals and they were bringing to this place uh, living without any shepherd or uh, other uh, expenses living on the field and they were grazing so it was very uh, successful uh, these farmers expanded this year uh, the plot next uh, slide next slide sorry uh, these uh, farmers expanded the plot and uh, we started project from 0 0.5 hectares. Now this plot is 1.2 hectare of land. They, uh, uh, they invested their own money to expand the plot. They seeded additional mixture of um, multi-species multi cover crop. And uh, again, uh, using the land for rotational grazing of their animals. Uh, today we were hearing a lot of uh, in, a lot of um, information from different speakers that we need demonstrations for farmers and youth and so, and so also I would like to mention also we need demonstration also for those kind of organizations we are which are uh, serving as a donors or uh, funding organizations because they also need to have examples of successful projects to be able to see what uh, would be the possible end result of their investment or their funding. So uh, based on that, I started cooperation with GIZ uh, organization, German International Development uh, Organization, which works in Armenia. They have a project EU47, uh, which is also, uh, next slide, please, which is going to implement uh, uh, projects in uh, one of the northern regions of Armenia. So uh, they uh, they visited uh, the first project site in 2022, and they were like, uh, they spoke with farmers, they saw the results of the project, and they got interested to implement the same kind of project in uh, uh, that region. So uh, in this slide, you see uh, the picture of the plot uh, which we established during the 2022, mm -hmm. and this is from uh, spring 2023. Uh, so this land also was overused, overgrazed in uh, in uh, that northern region. Uh, in this uh, next slide, in this uh, during these projects, we used next slide. Um, during these projects, uh, this is the example of the multi-species mixture of cover crop that we used. It is specially designed, uh, the producer specially designed in uh, this uh, mixture in order to be suitable for animals to graze and increase their body weight and be uh, applicable for farmers for their um, animal breeding practices. Next slide. Uh, during these uh, two projects, I paid uh, our organization, where I serve as an expert, um, paid very um, uh, much attention to disseminating the knowledge and the exper experience that we gained during those projects. In this slide, you see uh, the workshops and trainings that I'm conducting for farmers in different villages and different regions of Armenia. And uh, during my study at the US, I encountered very interesting book, Dirt to Soil book, which um, again, the speakers over here were talking today that the uh, you know, information about the innovation and the knowledge should be in a language which is very much uh, understandable for farmers and other people. So this book, I would like to suggest uh, any interested person to read, this is written by a farmer for farmer, 
this farmer is explaining very complex uh, complex uh, uh, scientific things in very very um, interesting and simple way way which even any person can read and enjoy the and understand the how to restore the um, soil health how what is the regenerative agriculture so I initiated the translation of this book into Armenian and on the picture you see on the left side is the Armenian version of this book. The, I have very good relationship with Gabe Brown and the publishers of this book. And also I developed a Facebook page at this moment, uh, which is for uh, sharing the knowledge and research information that I gained during the study in US about soil health and regenerative agriculture. I placed that information over there and uh, do online translation. Unfortunately, I don't have means to do uh, very scientific based translations. So in order that the information to be available for our farmers. And I deeply think that uh, based on my ex recent experience that uh, Armenia really needs further funding for showing more uh, climate smart agricultural practices in more regions of Armenia and replicate the successful uh, projects that were implemented. And the most important uh, in Armenia, we don't have that much inform information and uh, management information system related or tools related to climate smart agriculture. So that's uh, why I need, I, I think there is need for further uh, funding opportunities for these reasons. Next slide. Um, here is my next slide. Here is my contact information. Thank you for your attention. And if you have question, I'm ready to answer. Project, thank you so much. Another great example of cross-boundary collaboration, multi-stakeholder participation, farmer to farmer learning. Boy, so many lessons learned that you picked up and brought back to us and validated. So thank you so much. And um, Armenia is a first time member of GAXA. So we're glad to have a new member with us and new members bring new ideas. So thank you very much. Okay, our last example of GAXA members in action today is going to be one on enabling policies. And Dr. Rosa Macera, a full professor at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, a longtime GAXA member and co-chair of an action group is going to be talking about some of the work she's been doing in the enabling policy arena. So Rosa, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ernie, for, for this uh, presentation. I just want to, to start speaking uh, by what is, uh, I mean, all of us know uh, what is uh, climate smart agriculture that has to be practices that are used, uh, uh, that are economically viable that mitigates climate change and the very end adapts our cultural systems to uh, climate change. So the question is how enabling environment working group can just move this forward? Because under our understanding, we thought that there are three main legs. The first one is the development of the technology. We need researchers and these kind of things and people that is able to put that really, really at the front. But at the same time, we need to have the knowledge that of the farmers and of the youth, as we saw this morning, because these are the best ones that are able to adapt what the researchers do at the field at the field uh, level. But this uh, is done uh, thanks to the promotion of something that in the European Union is called multi-actor approach, meaning that farmers, policymakers, retailers, researchers has to be working to to foster this type of uh, CSA. A movement from the very beginning to co-generate uh, and co-create solutions, real solutions that are implemented at field level. That is uh, pretty pretty clear. So technology development, multi-actor approach, and of course policy, not only to support some activities, uh, to pay for some eco for ecosystem services, as was mentioned this morning, but also to support an enabling environment that fosters the use of uh, sustainable land uses, like for example, the, the CSA, CSA. I'm not going to speak about any specific uh, result because we have many uh, on this. So we are. I'm going to say what has, has been done, but a set of, uh, of uh, participants that comes from 20 different nations 
and thanks to the funding of the European Commission that reaches in total 28 million euros. And our main topic is about agroforestry and agroecology as two of the main useful tools to increase soil carbon sequestration and uh, uh, reduce the, the use of biocides and reduce also the em em emissions of the greenhouse gases. So uh, here you have our recent uh, uh, work with different uh, areas of the world. We asked recently, thanks to the CSA, for a European Union project, Forest for You, where forest, it, 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 it aims at to foster in 14 living labs across uh, the EU, plus one living lab in China, the ecological uh, uh, use of, of, of the forest. In Europe, we are working in different uh, standing committees just to, to increase the knowledge awareness and to move the living labs, such as SCAR agroecology. In South America, we just asked for increasing soil carbon sequestration with Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, a project that is uh, funded by Fontagro. Internationally, we are we have an, an, are really connected with FAO with another initiative different from the GAXA, which is the current global agroforestry capacity needs assessment that uh, conducted a survey that was answered for, for over 800 different members in, the, in different countries of the world. So uh, we are just trying to, to help in the, in the analysis. I will skip the Circular by Economy Alliance because this is a new initiative that I think that can help a lot to the CSA. Under Trees is a European Union project that involves Tanzania, uh, Ghana, Chile, and aims at uh, helping policymakers to foster agroforestry in these different uh, countries. And thanks also to the CATSA, we are working in the Nairobi Work, work pro Program, uh, which is which together with Alison, we are developing different initiatives just to help to, to foster CSA. Next slide, please. So there you have in yellow, the different countries that are part of the Circular Economy Alliance. Circular economy is really important because waste are a key problem uh, uh, and they can be used within, I mean, this waste can be used as a useful raw material for uh, different CSA uh, practices. They are establishing this, all these countries are establishing living labs. They were funded or started uh, early this year, and we will try to help them to develop these living labs as to work with them. So that is an initiative that was promoted by the European Forest Institute, and we are collaborating with them. This next slide. And in here, I don't want you to read everything. It's just uh, to show up the different papers that we produced with the different researchers and even farmers from 20 countries, as I mentioned before that some of them are very, te very technical, like for example, tree crop ecological and physiological interactions. These papers were produced in the last year. This is the common, that is what I, we, we put it there. But some of them are very useful for, for policymakers. Like for example, are, can agroforest systems enhance biodiversity or is agroforest a sustainable land use option to reduce wildfire risk, therefore to, to reduce um, um, greenhouse gases emissions or can mixtures of forestry and agroforestry alleviate trade-offs between different ecosystem services? And the, the answer to all of this is yes. And this, these are the summaries that we have there. Let's, let's move to the next one, please. In here, we have uh, aspects related with land management, mainly associated with different type of soils, like for example, semi-arid uh, uh, ecosystems associated with the increase of soil carbon sequestration, which is key because the, the, as you know, soil carbon represents the 85% the of the carbon that is stored by a, a, a terrestrial a, ecosystems. We also propose in these reviews, together with farmers, some uh, key aspects, key, key, key strategies just to reduce this uh, fire risk, like for example, the prescribed burning uh, issue. This next one, please. And well, we have a set of 15 papers that are trying to help policymakers with policies. In this case, we have, uh, well, I, we selected the ones that were uh, promote, just published in the, in the last year. And the idea is to know the baseline of uh, any kind of uh, land use system. It could be agroforest, but it could be agro an agroecological uh, practice. Have a look how it is promoted from a policy perspective. 
explain or, or try to give insights from a technical point of view to the policymakers about how they, what are they doing wrong, just taking into account not, not, not only the technical aspect, but also the social aspect. And that is really important in Europe because we had at the, up to now just one policy for the whole Europe. The social environment was completely different, so it was not very well uh, successful. And when we have the baseline, we have the policies, we can make recommendations to them. The final thing is to see if these policies really creates an impact on this baseline. Okay, so that, that is the kind of uh, aspect that we did in this, uh, in this paper. Next slide. But we are moving forward and uh, I, I will just propose before the, the, the crowd uh, sessions, uh, some new ideas on what we are working now, thanks to the funds of the European uh, Commission, which is about the development of, of uh, bioeconomy. We do believe that moving the land, the, the sustainability at land use level, uh, the, the sustainability with uh, um, agricultural practices should be driven by the consumers. So it will have a, a supportive value chains or supply chains that would be great. I think someone in the floor this morning says, give you a lucrative a tool to a farmer they, and they will move. So the idea is that, and this is the movement that we are now initiating at the European level. You can see there some uh, aspects like, for example, the development of technology that is quite good to, in, to enhance this bioeconomy uh, environment. Like for example, the use of grass to produce biogas, paper, or uh, animal bedding or biochar, etc. You have there another one, which is about how multi-actor approach can be conducted to include and, and increase the, the participation of farmers and any kind of um, a stakeholder or actor that is needed to create a solution to move forward the, the sustainable use of the, of the either of the land or of the supply chain. Here in the next slide, you have two uh, special issues. Uh, that we are developing with regard to, to these topics. One is the carbon sequestration because of the relevance I mentioned. And the other one was, I think, with a sexy title, which is Can the Trees Save the Crops? This next slide. And now uh, beside, we are just collaborating with people from 10 countries, just developing a, a tool and a set of tools of, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a publication of soil organic cars carbon estimations because the baseline on the soil is needed just to promote any kind of activity that increases it, as you can imagine. We were given recently a project which is uh, awarded with uh, 3 million euros. It started last uh, one of uh, January. There is floor there and some money to collaborate with all of you. Uh, let's call it agroforestry uh, for business uh, innovation uh, networks. Uh, the acronym is the one that you see there, agroforestry for EU. And in there, nine uh, countries are developing, okay, nine countries are developing um, value chains, modeling by value, by value chain supply chains uh, with regard to agroforestry, in, and in total, we will be developing 33 models that will understand and will take into account the uh, uh, economic aspect, the productive economic aspect, the uh, environmental aspect, and the social aspect. Recently, with the Global Research Alliance, which is an institution that uh, embraces and is formed by 67 countries all over the world, uh, we are leading a flagship on agroecology and agroforestry, just trying precisely to give uh, the policymakers help just to, to how to foster the sustainable land use system, taking into account both the agroecosystem, but also the, um, the value chain within the agroforestry for you. We don't, we don't, we, besides taking into account the business models, we will develop a, an, an adequate advisory systems across Europe. And of course, a knowledge platform with information for researchers, policymakers, but also adapted to farmers just to uh, uh, help it. If you can move to the next one and I am ending, this is the, uh, just a picture. So there you have the acronyms of all the projects that we have that represents this, this 28 million euros just in case you need, uh, you wish to collaborate in any of them, that would be more than welcome. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Rosa. Great examples of how enabling policies can unleash actions that we then can pick up on and implement. So we've just given you five examples of, NAXA, of GAXA members in action doing work. And I know we're running a little bit late on time, but I noticed that Hans allowed us to go over 15 minutes in the morning session. So I'm going to take the liberty data of maybe going over 10 minutes in the afternoon section, because from here we adjourn for a reception on the roof. So we could work just a little bit longer. But before we go into our breakout sessions, uh, let me just pause and come back to see if are there any clarifying questions that anyone has on the five presentations that we had. And I, I remember you in the corner. And so we have two questions that we have. So let's go to the back of the room. If you could. Uh, introduce yourself and direct the question to whoever uh, uh, your target is and try to be brief. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Michael, Michael Lutoki Foundation from Nigeria. Firstly, I commend all the members that were able to implement projects. And we also appreciate GASA that have given them the enable environment to do that. I saw the work was excellent indeed. And I really very happy of getting a lot of information. So the question does in the selections of the countries, is there any need assessment being done? I respect for the projects to be uh, taken to that countries. That's first. Then we also encourage GASA to also consider other countries that have not having the opportunities to implement a project. I may talk on behalf of the African countries, firstly, West African countries, that is Nigeria. Yeah, and my colleague also, Zimbabwe, we also want a project in each of the countries because there's a lot of activities going on in global climate change, which has not gone to the round table of the international. Yeah, I want to stop for that people to contribute. Okay, commendation thank and thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that that originally was directed at Shamey. Shamey, are you still on? And if not, perhaps Clive Grain could feel that about the future expansion of. Clive, use your mic. There. Okay. Um, so our project is primarily funded by the government of Canada, not through GAXA. We received $15 million over five years. And then our member companies contributed another 2 million. So for a total of 17, we went through a process of the with the government of Canada where they um, uh, provided us with uh, their preferential countries, which are kind of based on a combination of uh, countries where Canada has good relations, they see positive uh, potential outcome for those countries, but but also um, uh, the, where there's a real need as well. So it's a complex matrix. And, uh, you know, so we're looking in uh, at the end of this project in 2024, we're looking to expand to three more countries. Right now, the consideration is for uh, Malawi, Tanzania and Cote d'Ivoire, um, but we're also aware that our project could be more efficient and more continental in scope. And so we're looking at ways that using the experience from our existing countries, the new countries going to, we can bring more uh, extension tools, et cetera, throughout uh, the country. And I've already had some discussion with people in uh, Nigeria in, in the industry, and there's a lot of interest there as well. Okay, thank you, Clyde. And one final question on the side here. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Domenico Vito, Global Climate Smart Agricultural Youth Network, Italy. So first of all, thank you all for the presentation. Uh, my question was in particular for the last one of Dr. Maria Rosa Mosquera. So um, thank you very much, first of all, for the overview of the European context. And also, it's interesting uh, also to know that there are funding also available and platforms that connect uh, governments and uh, also connect uh, European funds uh, with the local, like uh, the grassroots level. Actually, I very agree when you say that, um, especially regarding agroecology, uh, the networks are very active, the citizen network, community networks are very active to implement uh, 
clearly agroecology principles. And my question is about properly that, to which extent the, we can say, even the commission is using agroecology in, we can say, in a strict way, because sometimes agroecology comprises a lot of practices that is not clear at the European Commission level. And how do you think that the grassroots levels, like the community activated networks, I don't know, I think, for example, urgency or other networks, can access to this kind of platform and so on. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yes. Trying to be brief because we have to move up, but we can discuss afterwards. Uh, the European Commission is quite aware of the agroecology. The problem of agroecology, what you mentioned, there is not a specific uh, definition for agroecology that all of us uh, can accept. So we are working on the definition. I'm World Package Leader of one of the two. A CSA, so the CSA meaning a coordination and support action that are in Europe is already an agroecology for you. On do, these two will be the, are the pillars for definition of agroecology for the next, next, next period. And they are so strong that they created the agroecology partnership uh, that will release a lot of funds at the end of this year. The governments are part of them and there will be open calls just to implement and to work about uh, agroecology. And they will create through the different missions, like mission soils, more than 100 living labs at regional and sub-regional level. So there could be a lot of money for that. And, and that is, that is uh, good. And with regard to the participation of the people on the different European Union projects, we have to know the call. And there are all members, so most of the members uh, at least all the members that are developing countries can participate as associating countries in 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 the in the in the European Union projects. Uh, for example, we ask it okay, already with data some projects, and that is possible. Just in case you are interested. Okay, thank you. Okay, we hope you found those examples of GAXA members in action of interest and stimulating and inspirational. We're now going to go through a shortened quick exercise where we're going to break into three groups in this room and three groups online. We have two questions that we'd like you to quickly process. This is top of mind stuff, a little bit like the popcorn exercise that we ended the first morning session with. The first question is, what do you, what do you need? What do you need to scale up the adoption of climate smart ag systems and practices? We just had examples. So if there's anything that you need, that you could just quickly identify that will help us as we go forward. And the second question is, how can GAXA help facilitate and support these efforts? So what do you need and how can GAXA help? So to move us along quickly, because we are gonna cut this to 10 minutes, the three groups online will be divided uh, virtually and we have facilitators um, from Cornell and Rose's network that will be guiding the 10 minute session. And in this room, we're gonna break into three and I'm just gonna do this very arbitrarily. So if this corner of the room up to you, maybe could be huddle in the back and be group one. Us up through the gentleman here from Uganda will be group two and you folks in the back huddle will be group three. And I'm staying here. And I will go with I the group be, over here. Oh, you go over there and I I'll go there. And then go work in groups at the end. Okay. Okay. So remember your two questions. Okay. Good. Go. We'll call you back in 10 minutes. We did well. Good. We got good stuff. We did too. And we're not going to report out. We'll capture them and send them okay. around. But thanks. Do you want to thank the people individually? Debbie. Yeah. Just say their first names, Debbie. You can read them because okay. I can't read or write these. We're not going to report back. No. Right. Okay. Group number. One, one no. 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 Okay. Group number one in the back, we're calling you forward to adjourn. Rosa, we need to bring your group forward because we're going to close out our session here. What's that? You think we can? One minute. Okay. All right. It, I was worried about the time. You're not worried? Five minutes. Ah, five okay. minutes. Okay. So just top of my one minute flash. And 30 then we'll, seconds. And then we'll type up. Yes. Okay. We're going to proceed forward as, as group one continues to caucus in the back. 
And Rosa. Because, because we are short on time, we're going to ask each group to have a very, very short, we're gonna ask each group to have a very short one minute recap, just giving examples of the type of responses that you received to the questions. And then what we will do is type up all of the responses and circulate them with the meeting notes. But just to give us a flavor of what you all just did in this flash exercise, if we could start with who's who might be ready. Um, Allison is ready, so go with group two. All right, group two had a fantastic discussion with participation from the US, Uganda, Kenya, Canada, and FAO. And um, it's amazing that what our Uganda representative was talking about was echoed by the US farmer. So farmers need to increase awareness of CSA so that they perceive the economic returns and reduce the risk. Um, our Uganda representative said we need to get farmers involved from the beginning in these solutions so that they own them and they can share the benefits of changing practices. Um, from Kenya, we talked about the importance of trained extension officers. We talk about this often, but we really need to fund trained extension officers and to be able to show increased productivity. Um, for what GAXA can do, we really need to ramp up GAXA's role as a clearinghouse for knowledge sharing. And um, finally, talk about practices, not necessarily CSA. Um, build on the good work that farmers are already doing. Thank you. Great, great example. So Rose's group is huddling in the corner there. Is there someone that can give us a one minute flash report out of what you talked about? Rose, is that you or the recorder? Uh, no, what did you say? I, 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 have to... <laughs> I have to say thank you very much because we have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of answers for that, but I can just highlight some of them. Uh, well, they say that we have to have a consi consistency when building the good uh, results of, uh, of, of uh, yeah, the good results and how to share them. Case studies and successful case studies has to be shared and scaling up, knowledge uh, sharing. It should be market dominant. There was a good uh, comment from, uh, from Thailand. They say that it should be economic viable for the <laughs> For all that, otherwise it will not work. The, the public-private partnership was highlighting as a very important and relevant issue. The baseline for carbon sequestration in, in soils, now that we are going to remove it on carbon uh, credits, it's, uh, it is really, 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 it was really, uh, really important. I mean, I can. I mean, other, other aspects, interagency collaboration, interministerial collaboration is also key because usually they are not collaborating. They we said in Spain that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So, and uh, yeah, I the creation of clusters of a small vulnerable farmers in CSA com community uh, practitioners. Mm, well, Good I account. think, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. We will make it with uh, the pointer and uh, we, will, we will explain that, okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Rosa. Our group huddled in the corner and a number of the items that were already lifted up were themes that came out of our group, but there were three in particular that really resonated as I was listening and we'll capture the complete list and circulate it as everyone will. But one, there was a call for more of this case study knowledge sharing, mm -hmm. the mentoring, the fellowship uh, that, that we've been building within the GAXA family. There's such an opportunity to share experiences and insight and lessons learned, problems um, encountered and so forth. So I heard that loud and clear. A second um, interesting uh, observation was a call for help from FAO, asking for FAO to be more proactive at the country level, mm -hmm. working to support climate smart agriculture projects and programs. So that's something, uh, Hans, that I think we need to take up with our FRO partners in terms of what they can do to really lift up and further enable this type of work. And the third example I would probably cite is the need for um, 
better financing mechanisms to cover the cost of implementation. People have great ideas, but they get stuck when there isn't adequate funding. So a call was made for more countries to step up and participate and fund, or if not fund, help enable. And it's not just the countries they were calling for, but the private sector can do more as well. So there was really, I think, a call to action. And that's what we were going to end with anyway. So that coming out of this breakout session is just a reaffirmation of the value of GAXA. So we are nothing more than the sum of our combined participation. And when we work together, we all benefit. When we work in silos and don't share, we miss opportunities. So GAXA was created to be a multi-stakeholder, cross-boundary, meaning cross-hemisphere, cross-ocean, cross-country boundary platform to experiment, to take risks, to achieve successes, to share and scale. And there is no other entity that we know of, like GAXA, where governments, academia, private sector, farmer organizations, civil society, and set aside differences and unite and team up to advance something we all benefit from. So with that very rushed close. Are we doing the three groups online? Yes, we, we so three groups yes. online, if, if, if one minute. So go ahead. All right, can I please call on Debbie Aller from Cornell University to just give a one minute summation? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Allison, um, for that. So we we had a relatively small group within our breakout session um, online, but I think we identified a few key bullets um, about scaling up the adoption of climate smart agriculture and really emphasizing the need for inclusion of private entities into the conversation and access to financing because many of these technologies are available, but often there's limited um, limited capacity building um, and the need for co-generation of knowledge with other indigenous communities and organizations within regions um, and countries. Um, there's a need to develop innovative ways to make sure we're integrating um, technologies and knowledge to scale up the adoption. Um, and some of the things we identified in terms of how can GAXA facilitate and support these efforts are around um, acting as the platform to mobilize regional partnerships and funding to different regions and organizations, um, bringing together all the partners as it, as it has done already to create one unified voice and message to share as it comes to, as it relates to climate smart agriculture. And so we all have the same agenda, the same goals in mind, um, but how can we create a unified message there? Um, and the last thing is making sure or GAXA can really help coordinate advocacy and training across regions and amongst members as well. Um, and the final important thing I thought that, that was brought um, to the forefront within our conversation was creating an overall inventory that documents um, both the regional global problems, challenges, and solutions. So we have everything within one platform that can be shared um, to the broader communities um, and parts of the world. So thanks very much. Thank you, Deb. Thank you so much. That was great. And can we hear from Vanessa Alvarez Lopez? Yes. Uh, we were also a short number of, of people. We were around uh, five or six persons. So um, we identified some bullet points for the first question. What do you need to scale up the adoption? So the first was uh, that the policies uh, must be aligned to the to the practices. We also identified public awareness to, to reach out the people that need the policies, engagement or, or consultations with the farmers. Um, technologies that must be uh, context specific, even within a, a country or a region. And finally, take into consideration the already existing knowledge of the of the people that can help to uptake the adoption. And regarding the second question, how can GAXA facilitate um, the work? Um, 
through a, a, some points were identified, such as the, the research sharing, for example, through uh, creation of, of websites with resources available either for, for researchers, but also in a simple way, such as um, fact sheets or new latest newsletters to the farmers. Also, we identify uh, awareness creation, uh, finances, and the, the investment, as well as capacity building must be considered the technologies must be, um, must be must be them, but um, we need to know how to use them or how to fix them. Also, the partnering with the universities from the from various countries, supporting research work uh, between or among institutions. Uh, at country level, provide guidance to national governments to provide enough funding for the developing the the practices. Uh, strength regional alliances and finally uh, to create a baseline surveys or, or to create a, a scan, scan on environmental needs to, to detect uh, our problems to convince the private sector to, to invest in our practices. Great. <laughs> Excellent job, Vanessa. Thank you so much. And finally, we're going to turn to Javier Rodriguez Riguero from the final group. Thank you very much uh, for this meeting and interesting presentations and hopefully also very fruitful meeting for the future. Uh, on the on the enabling environment action group, uh, we have been uh, we were really a short number also of participants, but we have identified some uh, valid points regarding the first question, what do we need to scale up the adoption of climate smart agricultural systems and practices like the ones we just heard about, we have identified that uh, it is needed more funding from governments to recruit farmers and link them to technical service providers to strengthen uh, these connections from an agroforestry point of view. Uh, also, that uh, it is a need uh, for, um, for investments in infrastructure, infrastructures like irrigation for supporting the transition towards the climate smart agriculture, to adapt international and national policies to the regional characteristics and different uh, climate biogeographical regions, and to add financial or institutional support mechanisms to assist farmers to the technological transitions uh, transition and uh, as for accessing new and expensive uh, climate smart technologies. Yeah, so this is a barrier for most of the of the farmers. Uh, how can GAXA help to facilitate or to support these uh, efforts in your country organization? Uh, GAXA can support the transition from global and national policies towards a more regional perspective for funding and advisory services, etc. Uh, GAXA can support also by creating global partnerships, facilitating local adaptation, adaptation to climate smart systems and facilitate uh, the networking. Also by facilitating and or adding linkages with funding institutions as the World Bank and to provide by providing guidelines on climate smart investments for the uh, different regions across the world. And that's all from our side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Javier. That was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I think we've uh, uh, reached the conclusion of the action group section of the report. Uh, thank you to Rosa and to Allison for helping to co-convene this session. Thank you to you all for your patience or participation. Uh, like everything else, we don't have enough time to cover everything we like, but boy, we did a lot of good work. So thank you. And Hans and Dada, over to you for our close. Thank you very, very much. I'm impressed by the results and also a little bit sad because now we have to implement it. <laughs> no, I'm not sad. I'm very positive because I think there are many elements which we can work on, which we have to work on. And tomorrow, it's a good already start for tomorrow because tomorrow we have some of the new programs and projects we want to implement which are taking up some of those elements. But I've, and also the team is noting it even more, it's clear that we can elevate the work of GAXA turning from awareness raising and the concept into marking the shift towards action at the national, implementation at the national level. And of course, we will work hard, 
but it depends on all of us, but we'll discuss it tomorrow. I really would like to thank the three Ernie, Rosa, and Alison for your hard work also in the preparations. Already now, I would really like to thank the team who is making this possible. Frederica, Valentina, and we always speak about gender, but this is an all ladies team. <laughs> so we see the positive effects of an all lady team. Thank you already so much for the hard work. Now, yes, now it's time because GAXA is a networking organization. Now it's time to network, but to relax as well. And we have beautiful wines for you upstairs at the eighth floor. From the, and I have to read it out. I hope do I do it right this time. Geneva Coppa Choli. It's a vineyard near to Rome. They present their wines. Of course, it are climate smart wines. You can be assured. And of course, there are other things, water and juices as well. But let's enjoy ourselves. Let's enjoy our company because it was a hard day of work. So now relax, enjoy the beautiful view. And as far as, although it was quite dark here in this room, at least no lights, you can enjoy. I think there's still sun, <laughs> the remaining sunshine at the eighth floor. See you there and come back tomorrow at nine o'clock sharp in this room again. Thank you so much. <laughs>